Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is endothelium-dependent vasodilatation. Okay, so let me outline the structure then for this video. What we're going to start off with is a big picture. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about uh, local vascular control. Okay, and we're going to see how uh, the control of the um, diameters of arterioles is continually at this balance, okay, between forces that are trying to make the blood vessels constrict and the forces that are trying to make the blood vessel dilatate. Okay, and what we will then study is how the arterial smooth muscle actually can be induced to contract. And then what we'll move on to is the mechanisms of endothelium dependent vasodilatation. So the endothelium is continually sending messages that tell uh, the um, arterial, the smooth muscle to relax basically. Okay, so we want to see what these mechanisms are. Now the principal one is nitric oxide, so that's the first one that we'll study. However, there are other mechanisms beyond nitric oxide. There's also prostacyclin, which is extremely important and which we'll have a look at. And then finally, there's also a phenomenon known as endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization, okay, which is still a very controversial issue. And it seems that there are many, many mechanisms responsible for the phenomenon of endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization. We will look at two mechanisms, the two main ones. Firstly, the contact-mediated mechanism, and then we'll look at the mechanism involving a factor that diffuses from the endothelial cells to the smooth muscle cells and causes the hyperpolarization, which will be the uh, epoxy icosatrinoic acids, EATS. Okay, right. So then, we're going to start off then with a big picture of local vascular control, okay? And for this, we need the big picture of how the circulatory system works. So I'm going to start off by drawing a big picture of the circulatory system. So, this box here, this is going to represent your heart, okay? And I'm not going to draw the four separate chambers of the heart. The heart is just going to be represented as a single box here. This will represent all four chambers of the heart, and it's also going to represent the pulmonary circulation, okay? And then what it's going to be doing is pumping blood into the arterial system here, okay? like so, and then the blood will be moving through little blood vessels known as arterioles, okay, which will drain the arterial system here. Okay, so let's colour in the different components here. So here in red, this is the arterial system, okay. Now every time the heart pumps out a uh, stroke volume's worth of blood into the arterial system, what will happen is the arterial system blood vessels are very elastic, okay? So they will stretch, they'll bulge, basically, okay? So, every time the heart beats, it pumps a stroke volume's worth of blood, which is a special keyword. SV means stroke volume. That just means how much blood the heart ejects every time it beats. Okay, so every time the heart beats, it's going to eject a stroke volume's worth of blood into the arterial system. And the arterial system contains blood vessels that are very elastic. So what's going to happen is when that blood is pushed into the arterial system, the arterial system vessels will bulge to accommodate that new volume of blood. Okay, and then what's going to happen is the elastic recoil of the arteries will be pushing the blood onwards, and they're going to push it through the next blood vessels, which are the arterioles here. Now, these are the main resistance vessels of the circulatory system. So what's going to happen is blood's going to gradually go through the arterioles, and the arterial system will then uh, gradually return back to its original size. So the elastic blood vessels of the arterial system will recoil back down, and as they do so, they'll be pushing the blood through the arterioles here. Okay, so I'll colour in this arteriole here in orange, okay? And arterioles are very, very small blood vessels, as we'll see in a moment, okay? And then uh, onwards from that, you have even smaller blood vessels, so the arterioles will break into the capillaries, which are even smaller, okay? So here are two capillaries here, 
okay? And the capillaries are uh, literally one cell thick, so the lumens of capillaries can literally only accommodate one red blood cell within them, okay? So this is the capillary system, and this is the main site where uh, nutrient exchange is actually going to occur, okay? Then what's going to ha happen is the capillaries are going to reconverge into a venule here, so if we just colour these different bits in, so here in green, these are the capillaries, okay? And then uh, here we'll have a venule, and what colour can I colour the venule in? I might do it in turquoise. So here in turquoise, this is our venule, which is a similar size to arterioles, but without the smooth muscle surrounding it, as we'll see in a moment. And then the venules will drain into the venous system, which will then go back to the heart. Now you will notice that I have not shown the pulmonary circulation on here, that's included within the heart. So the heart is moving blood from the venous system, it'll pump it around the pulmonary system, and then it will pump it into the arterial system. So that's all just uh, abbreviated down to the heart there. Okay, right. So let's just go over the entire thing again, just to make sure that we have the full picture. So, the heart picks up stroke volumes worth of blood from the venous system here, and I haven't labelled the venous system up, let me just correct that. This is the venous system here. Okay, so the heart picks up a stroke volumes worth of blood from the venous system, pushes it round the pulmonary circulation so that it gets oxygenated, okay, and then pushes it into the arterial system. The arterial system comprises arteries that are very elastic, so for instance the aorta is fantastically elastic. So what will happen is when that stroke volume's worth of blood is forced into the arterial system, those uh, blood vessels will expand to cope with that increased amount of blood there. Okay. Then what will gradually happen is the arterial system arteries will recoil under the elastic recoil, and they'll force the blood onwards through much smaller vessels known as arterioles, and then that blood will go through the capillary system and then back uh, via venules into the venous system. Okay, right. So, the key way then that you control the amount of blood going to a certain local area is through these arterioles. So if we've got a little portion of tissue here, okay, so here's a little portion of tissue. Okay, and this is just one little portion of peripheral tissue that we've shown here. The way that you can control the amount of blood flowing to this little portion of peripheral tissue here is by controlling the diameter of this arteriole here. This arteriole controls how much blood is going to be allowed to come from the arterial system through uh, the arteriole, then through the capillary systems, and then into the venule in this local piece of tissue, and therefore it controls how much blood flow uh, this local piece of tissue gets. Okay, so if that arteriole were to constrict, that would decrease the amount of blood flow to this area, and it would mean that m more blood was going to remain in the arterial system, and that could go to other places. Okay. Um, if, however, it was to vasodilatate, i.e. Um, widen, uh, then it would allow more blood to flow through this little portion of tissue here, and therefore you'd increase the perfusion to that area. Okay, so these arterioles, they control how much blood flows to the area that they supply, basically. Okay, now, I'd like to go into the structure of the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules in a little bit more detail. These are the components of what are known as the microcirculation, the small uh, blood vessels which control blood flow to little local portions of tissue. Okay, and uh, really this video is completely uh, concerning the way that the contraction of these arterioles here is controlled, basically. And we're going to look at um, both the signals which are telling these arterioles to constrict and the signals that are telling these arterioles to dilatate. And usually what happens is that there's a balance at normal homeostasis between these two signals, and then to make the arteriole either constrict or dilatate, you need to tip the balance in one way or the other. Okay, and it's that that we're going to study. Right, okay, so let's just study then the structure of these components of the microcirculation then. So we'll start off with arterioles. 
So arterioles are very small blood vessels. These are not like arteries. Arteries are massive blood vessels that you learn the names of in anatomy. Arterioles are tiny little blood vessels, okay? So let's show the sort of size of these things. So, basically, arterioles consist of two main layers. The wall of an arteriole consists of two main layers. And what I'm doing is taking a cross section uh, through an arteriole here. So we've chopped through uh, an arteriole and we're looking at the cross section. So this line that I have coloured in in turquoise here, this is going to be the basement membrane of the endothelium. So I was just about to tell you what the two layers of an arteriole were. So the two layers of an arteriole are the endothelium and then uh, a smooth muscle cell layer underneath the endothelium. Okay, so this turquoise line that I've started off by showing here, this is the basement membrane of the endothelium of the arteriole. Okay, so this is made up of a meshwork of proteins, and it's this meshwork which the endothelial cells are going to be attached to. Okay, so here are the endothelial cells. And this will give you a sort of idea of the size of these blood vessels, okay? So they're bigger than capillaries, certainly, but you know, it doesn't take that many endothelial cells to completely line one of these arterioles here. So here are these endothelial cells. These are the nuclei of the endothelial cells. Right, so there's the endothelium shown here. So this is the endothelial cell, which I'll just abbreviate down to EC. The next layer that's outside of the endothelium, which is what we want to show now, is the smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, so, let me show this. So surrounding the basement membrane, you're then going to have a layer of smooth muscle cells. Okay, and let me draw a smooth muscle cell in here. So smooth muscle cells have this characteristic spindle shape, as it's called, where they have, um, they're thick at the centre, they have a thick belly, but then to either side they become thinner and thinner, so they have a spindle shape. Okay, now, smooth muscle cells are going to be connected tip to tip in rings, basically, like so. So, I'll draw a few, a, one of these rings. So here are these smooth muscle cells making up a ring within this uh, layer of smooth muscle cells. Now I should stress that when I say it's a layer of smooth muscle cells, I don't mean that it's simply one uh, smooth muscle cell thick. You know, you've got multiple smooth muscle cells. It's multiple layers of smooth muscle cells, if you like. Okay, right, so here is a ring of smooth muscle cells that are surrounding this arteriole. And now the idea is that if each one of these smooth muscle cells were to contract, then it would decrease in length. And you can see that if all of them decrease in length, what that's going to do is it's going to decrease the circumference of that ring. So just to draw a little picture of this, the ring is effectively going to go from this to this, drawn much smaller, of course, okay? Uh, and of course, when uh, rings decrease the circumference, then of course, they also decrease their diameter, and that's going to constrict the lumen uh, within. So that's how the contraction of these smooth muscle cells determines uh, the diameter of the lumen of these arterioles. Okay, and therefore, if these um, smooth muscle cells contract, then it's going to cause what's known as vasoconstriction, which means that the diameter of the lumen of the arteriole is decreasing. And if they uh, relax, then it's going to cause what's known as vasodilatation, which means that the um, diameter of the lumen of the arteriole is increasing. Now, I should just say, whilst we're discussing terminology, that some people will call vasodilatation just vasodilation, okay? It's a nicer word. I don't think it's partic specifically correct, okay? I don't know if it's a real word or not. I think it probably is a real word, but in the physiology textbooks, the correct word is vasodilatation, but often people use these two words interchangeably. They do mean the same thing. Okay, it's just that one's the slightly more correct one to use. Right, okay, so that's an arteriole then, and these are these blood vessels that determine how much blood is going to go to a specific portion of local tissue, okay, uh, because they can control the size of their lumen and therefore control how much blood is going to be coming from the arterial system into these capillary beds that they supply. Okay, let's just complete the microcirculation now by talking about what capillaries are and what um, venules are. 
So capillaries are much, much smaller compared to these arterioles. Capillaries are literally tiny little blood vessels. They are literally one cell thick, and usually it only takes one endothelial cell to completely surround uh, the um, surface of a capillary. Okay, so capillaries are this sort of size compared to the arterioles. Again, they have a basement membrane, which is shown there in turquoise. Okay, uh, and then you've got one endothelial cell completely surrounding the entire uh, circumference of the capillary here. Okay, so this is an arteriole, this is a capillary, and the capillaries do not have smooth muscle cells uh, surrounding them. Okay, so this arteriole is going to split into loads and loads of little capillaries. Okay, now to complete the microcirculation, we're not going to really talk about the venules, but we will complete the picture by talking about the structure of the venule. So the venules are a similar size to arterioles, okay, but they don't have the smooth muscle cells surrounding them. So they, again, uh, just have a um, wall that consists of an endothelium. Okay, so here, this is the basement membrane uh, of the endothelium here, and then you're going to have multiple endothelial cells surrounding, uh, while well, sitting on the basement membrane here. Okay, like so. Right, so it's really, a, a venule is just like, an, either you can view it as a giant capillary, okay, and there is some sense in viewing it as a giant capillary, okay, or you can uh, view it as an arteriole without the smooth muscle cells, it's um, that sort of structure, okay, so this is a venule. Right, okay, so that's the microcirculation then. What we now want to discuss is the big picture of how the contraction of these vascular smooth muscle cells, and that's another piece of terminology that I would just like to introduce. We will be using this abbreviation a lot, VSMC, so that I don't have to continually write out the full name, which is vascular, that's the V, and then SMC, whenever you see SMC in biology, it means smooth muscle cell. Okay, so this is a vascular smooth muscle cell. So we want to now discuss what this video is going to be completely about, is what controls uh, the contraction of these vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, and we are going to be looking at the local control of these vascular smooth muscle cells rather than the systemic control. Okay, so we're going to look at how this local tissue here controls um, the uh, contraction state of these vascular smooth muscle cells. Now, we're particularly going to focus on how the endothelial cells of the arterioles, but not just the arterioles, also the capillaries and the venules as well, how these endothelial cells that are in this local tissue control the smooth muscle cells surrounding the arterioles, and that's a phenomenon known as endothelium-dependent vasodilatation. So, in fact, the endothelial cells are always screaming at the smooth muscle cells of the arteriole to relax, basically, and vasodilatate uh, the arteriole to maintain blood flow to that area. Okay, right. So, but to put this properly in context, we need to look at the whole of local control. We need to also look at the things which are telling these vascular smooth muscle cells to contract all the time, okay, so that we can understand that there's always this balance between the pro-contraction stimuli and then all of these relaxation stimuli that are coming from the endothelial cells. Okay, right. Uh, so, we're going to start off with the big picture, and then we're going to go into things in detail. Okay, so the big picture then, we'll start off with what tells vascular smooth muscle cells to contract. Okay, so contraction, the pro-contraction forces. Okay, so, there are two main things. Well, there's one main thing, uh, which is that there are loads and loads of chemicals which can trigger these vascular smooth muscle cells to contract, and they're often being released by neurons which are innervating these uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, and these uh, molecules are going to act on a mixture of ligand-gated ion channels, which I'll abbreviate down to LGICs, but I should probably just write out the full term at least once. So ligand, that's the L, G is for gated, and then the IC is for ion channel. 
Okay, so ligand gated ion channels can be activated by loads of different molecules, okay, and loads of other stimuli besides just chemical stimuli. So, for instance, stretch stimuli of the vascular smooth muscle cells, okay, and what these can lead to is depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the uh, vascular smooth muscle cell, and this can then lead to the activation of voltage gated calcium channels, which allow calcium into the vascular smooth muscle cell cytoplasm, which then causes contraction, as we'll see later on. Okay. In addition, many molecules can act on G protein coupled receptors, GPCRs. Okay. So again, this stands for G. The P is for protein, and then the C is for coupled. And strictly speaking, you should have dashes in between G and protein, and protein and coupled, and then receptors, G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so many molecules can also activate G-protein coupled receptors on the surface of the vascular smooth muscle cells, and these tend to be uh, GQ coupled or potentially G11 coupled. So we often say GQ slash 11 because they both do the same thing. GQ is the more famous one, but G11 does exactly the same thing as GQ. Okay, they're almost identical in structure. We'll come on to that in, later on. Um, so um, they activate GQ slash 11 heterotrimer. G proteins and lead to the mobilization of calcium from intracellular stores, principally the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the equivalent of an endoplasmic reticulum, but since we're dealing with muscle cells, it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, right, uh, and that also leads to contraction. So calcium uh, in the cytoplasm of smooth muscle cells causes contraction, as it does in cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells. Although the mechanism by which calcium causes contraction is different in smooth muscle cells, as we'll see later on. Okay, right. Uh, so those are the pro-contraction uh, forces, which are many, many molecules, and principally neurotransmitters, which are telling these uh, smooth muscle cells to contract, either by opening ligand-gated ion channels, which then lead to depolarization and the activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, or by activating G-protein coupled receptors, which lead to mobilization of calcium from the intracellular stores. Okay, right, so those are the pro-contraction forces. Now let's talk about the pro-relaxation forces, and these come from the endothelium. So endothelium-dependent relaxation, basically, okay, which is the topic for this video. But to put it properly in context, we also need to know the uh, contraction schema. Okay, so endothelium-dependent relaxation. Okay, right, so basically, the endothelial cells of the arterioles, but not just the arterioles, and this is important to understand, it's not just the endothelial cells of the arterioles, it's also the endothelial cells of the capillary bed and of the venules. Okay, all of these endothelial cells tell these vascular smooth muscle cells to relax. Okay, and generally it's through um, chemical mediators that they release. Okay, so the endothelial cells all the time are releasing nitric oxide, which is an extremely important example of an endothelium-dependent relaxation mechanism, okay, which we will discuss in a huge amount of detail later on, okay, which tells uh, the vascular smooth muscle cells to relax, okay, and we'll see exactly how later on. Uh, they also release something known as prostaglandin I2, uh, which for short is abbreviated to PGI2, which also has another name. It's also known as prostacyclin. Okay, and prostacyclin also tells uh, vascular smooth muscle cells to relax. Okay, uh, and we'll see again how later on. And finally, there's also something known as EDH, okay, which stands for endothelium, that's the E and it's dependent hyperpolarization. Now, of all the endothelium-dependent relaxation mechanisms, endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization is the most controversial, okay? Um, the mechanisms of this are extremely complicated, okay? Because the problem is 
that loads of people have researched endothelium dependent hyperpolarization. They've all used different animals, they've all used different blood vessels, and the problem is they all come to different conclusions about how it occurs. They find it all over the place, but it seems to occur by different mechanisms all over the place, in different animals and in different blood vessels in different animals, okay? Um, we are going to look at the two principal mechanisms that are arising above all the other mechanisms that have been um, found for how this ha occurs, uh, and we're going to look at those two, because those probably are the most important. Okay, right. Uh, so I should probably just tell you what endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization actually is. Basically, the endothelial cells have a way of hyperpolarizing the smooth muscle cells. Okay, so hyperpolarizing the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the vascular smooth muscle cells. And this is called endothelium independent hyperpolarization. Now, why does that help relax the vascular smooth muscle cells? Well, remember, one of the principal ways the vascular smooth muscle cells are induced to contract is by opening ligand gated ion channels and uh, that depolarizing the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, which activates voltage gated calcium channels. So if we hyperpolarize the cell membrane, we're going to help to shut voltage-gated calcium channels and reduce calcium going into the cytoplasm of the vascular smooth muscle cells. Now, the two mechanisms that we're going to look at this are, one is the contact-mediated mechanism, okay, and this is only used by the endothelial cells in the um, arteriole, because in order to use the contact-mediated mechanism, the endothelial cells actually have to be in contact with the vascular smooth muscle cells. So it really only applies for the vascular smooth muscle cells that are right underneath the endothelial cells, such as this one that I've drawn here, okay, and we will have a look at how that works later on. And then there is also the concept of an endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor, EDHF, which is basically a chemical mediator that's released by endothelial cells which causes this hyperpolarization, okay? And that can be released by all the endothelial cells of the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules, all of the microcirculation, and, and can be diffusing over to the vascular smooth muscle cells of the arteriole and causing hyperpolarization and thus relaxation. And the one that we're going to look at, and as I say, there are loads of potential endothelial-derived hyperpolarizing factors that have been discovered, but the one that is rising above all the others seems to be the epoxy trinoic acids, the EATS, okay, and we'll discuss exactly what those are later on. Right, okay, so that then is the big picture of where we're going with all of this. Okay, we will call it there for this video, and in the next video what we will do is we will start off by looking at the pro-contraction uh, forces. We'll start off by looking at how you achieve contraction in vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, and we'll look at ligand-gated ion channels and GPCR mechanisms. Okay, because having a good understanding of the contraction mechanisms is absolutely essential for understanding how these uh, relaxation mechanisms are going to work. So really, we cannot discuss this without discussing this first. Okay, and it's important to understand that all the time in your blood vessels, this is happening and this is happening, and they're balancing each other out, basically, and they're keeping the arterioles open. If you want to vasoconstrict or vasodilatate the arterioles, you either need to upregulate this. If you upregulate this um, through increasing the amount of neurotransmitters that you're releasing onto the vascular smooth muscle cells, then you can cause constriction of the arterioles, okay? Or, if you want to cause vasodilatation, then you can upregulate this, okay? And that will cause, uh, th that will overbalance this, and you'll start uh, dilatating the blood vessel, and that's going to principally happen in, for instance, inflammation, okay? And we'll see exactly how that works later on. Okay, so in the next video, we will move on to the mechanism of contraction of vascular smooth muscle cells.